Thanks, Matt. Um, I, before I go on, I want to really uh, give a shout out to Mark Enns here. And really, a, a lot of this summary that I'm using today was developed by Mark. Mark actually chaired both of these subcommittees right now. And uh, I just happened to be on both of them and arguing with Mark. So, uh, so given that, uh, he, he put a lot of this together and I'm just trying to show you what some of our thought process is towards some of the changes or some of the newly developed guidelines in the case of BRDCR for the BIF guidelines. So uh, I think most of us are aware of the BIF guidelines, just a small primer if, uh, if some of you aren't. Um, basically the development of the guidelines is one of the uh, results in one of the primary missions of the BEEF uh, Improvement Fe Federation, which is to give approaches to assist member organizations in the development and operation of performance programs. And basically what that generally has to do with is giving a set of guidelines or rules for uh, breed associations and producers primarily to collect the data and record it, to, uh, to outline as much as possible the methodology used for national cattle evaluation and suggested methodologies that should be used for several of these trade complexes. And uh, not surprisingly, um, we're on, a, I, I believe this was the ninth edition in 2010, Mark, something to that effect, of the BAF guidelines. And, uh, and given the fact that we have nine editions, it's pretty important to continue to evolve these guidelines as new traits come online and as new methodologies to handle these traits uh, begin to be implemented. So uh, this is not an unusual task to try to look at new trait complexes and think how things should be changed. It's, it's just part of the natural evolution of trying to make national cattle evaluation better overall. So uh, particularly important, as I said, for new trait complex, I think Jared spoke earlier about reproduction and about uh, BAF subcommittees and reproduction and, and possible development of, of indicator traits that related to fertility. Um, these, these other two trait complexes that we're talking to here today are relatively new in the National Cattle Evaluation uh, Scheme as well. Feed intake had been written into the last version of the guidelines that was just published, as I said, about five years ago. Uh, bovine respiratory disease susceptibility has not been yet, but you heard a talk earlier by uh, Dr. Van Minum Allison uh, talking about uh, uh, some projects underway looking at respiratory disease and uh, and with the, uh, the uh, multi-institutional USDA grants that have come out in both of these trade complex recently, I think the time is now to try to use some of those results and see if we can do a better job of increasing our overall database, either for traditional genetic approaches or genomics that might improve, uh, improve both of these trade complexes. So why do we need a revision for, for feed intake overall? Well, um, I think Matt hinted earlier in his talk, there's a whole lot more facilities for measuring feed intake right now that have, that have come online really in the last five to 10 years. And uh, we're probably nowhere near the level that we need to be uh, to, to be able to record this trade on the level that typical national cattle evaluation uses feed intake right now. All the same, there are a lot of these out here right now. There are several on-farm tests that are being used by a certain group of elite producers, I'd say every year, uh, sometimes on systems that they built themselves, sometimes on a, on a uh, contract basis to make sure that their bulls are proven and, and actually are able to show differences for feed intake, RFI, RADG, whatever the case of the trade being reported might be. Um, these on-farm and centralized tests then having those around a little bit more has, has actually given us quite a bit more data um, and, and also uh, and resulting from different measuring systems being put in in universities or on farms around the country. We're just seeing a whole lot more uh, bore, uh, pour in and, and based on that we've seen a whole lot more research data being able to be analyzed in the last few years or, or field data that's given us a better idea of, of uh, what we may need to review in the current guidelines. Um, this was the guideline committee that was put together for this right now. I don't want to spend much time on this other than to say you've got a nice mix of some, some producers that are, that are highly aware of several of these uh, issues that go on with measurement of feed intake overall and then several academics that work closely with the Beef Improvement Federation or in nutritional aspects of feed intake overall. So, 
Um, the areas then that are under review right now are the length of the warm-up period, how long animals need to be in their system, being uh, measured on feed intake facilities before the actual feed intake trial starts, the length of the test for accurate measurement of feed intake overall, and whether that needs to be the same for feed intake as it does for body weight gain. You'll see that's a primary area that we're talking about here. Changes to potential changes to contemporary group definition and usual use of embryo transfer data. And the one I'm going to focus on, as I already hinted at here today, is the length of the test. So the current guidelines right now suggest a 21 day warm up period for animals to get used to the facilities, um, whether that be a KO Engage, Grow Safe, or Incentech. Um, I will say, depending on the system, the, the amount of time the animals need to just get used to eating out of these bunks does vary. Um, where uh, um, most, most people that I've talked to claim that grow safe is pretty fast. I would say Kalen Gates and Incentech, both of which involve actually a physical gate that blocks the animal from eating, both do take a little bit more time because of the, the system actually does hide the feed a bit from them until they're used to um, actually triggering the gates to open. Um, a 70 day test to get accurate measurement is the other suggestion and um, in the guidelines it says that a 45 day test for feed intake is probably sufficient but at the same time the recommendation in the guideline is for 70 and most of that is because of getting accurate body weight gain information rather than intake and in that guideline approach then in the past it's been assumed that feed intake and gain were on the exact same trial and we're being measured at the exact same time and therefore because the limiting factor is gain we should have the trial be as long as it is for gain. Okay, so take that into consideration right now. Um, there's some research then from Colorado State University that, that looks at the correlations among different levels of feed intake and weight gain off of a 70 day test and looks at those correlations within the subsets of days on that, of the same animals on that test from 0 to 14 days up to 0 to 56, or different intervals of the same length from 14 to 70 up to 56 to 70, so either beginning or end of the trial on these intervals. And if you'll notice there for feed intake overall, um, the correlations are fairly high. And this goes back to what was said already about having a 45 day window being sufficient for feed intake. You'll see, I, I would argue that 28 days is doing a pretty good job on a raw phenotypic correlation. As a geneticist, I'd suggest this usually, not always means that the genetic correlation is going to be even higher um, than that raw phenotypic correlation. And, uh, and that 28 day test for feed intake is, is probably sufficient, whereas you start to see that correlation break down as you get to shorter times for weight gain, although there's still some pretty high correlations on those 56 day test links. So um, there's another piece of information there. Um, in addition to that, um, if we've had some research coming out of the Meat Animal Research Center here, working with a student at Kansas State University for her master's thesis, and I don't want to spend much time on the what's and why's of what all of these things are on here necessarily, but the important thing I want you to point out to point out to you is for steer average daily gain relative to steer post weaning gain, there's a very high genetic correlation where post weaning gain is just weights that are being measured shortly after the animal is weaned using a weaning weight, of course, and then a, 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 a weight chosen out of the database for a group of animals born around the same time that seems to reflect yearling weight or yearling time the most, okay? So it's an optimal date so that the animals are weighed approximately on the same date, but it's trying to group our animals here at the Mino Research Center into something close to an average group yearling weight. And so it's not a particularly fancy weight. Our animals are weighed every 50 days or so, 50 to 60 days. And just picking one weight out of there and calculating a standard national cal evaluation post weaning gain, correlating that to the on test intake, uh, we get a very high correlation. So those two pieces of information um, led us to believe as a committee that, uh, and, and other information that's been around for a long time that, that intakes have very high genetic correlations all, all the way down to around 28 days 
uh, a 28 day genetic correlation intake is at 95% or better to a longer up to 140 day trial on other literature sources that there's probably an opportunity given that intake is really the limiting, limiting factor here of trying to recommend that intake should be shortened considerably um, in terms of the requirement on the BIF guidelines and try to decouple it from from gain overall, so that gain is measured somewhere outside, um, and uh, and that does create a few a few problems that need to be addressed. One of which is contemporary grouping and what happens to the diets of the animals after they go off the test if they're still being measured for gain. Those are considerations that we're trying to think about and whether that should be restricted and whether those contemporary groups need to may remain absolutely intact or not. Um, but most of those are fairly minor issues that can be handled. The important thing is this could, could almost double our use of the current feed intake facilities that are available right now and allow a whole lot more data to be collected if we, are, if we recommend a guideline that shortens the amount of feeding by, by almost half. And so we're, we're still deciding on an exact time interval. It's been down as low as 35 days in some of our discussion, which would be exactly half. The warm-up period may still need to be 21 days, so that's why we don't actually shorten the amount of time by half completely because we still need a warm-up period, but it would allow something like four or five rotations through the year instead of just three or so. So that's that's kind of summarizes the some of the changes um, there where we're looking at a few things, as I said, with, with embryo transfer, I imagine that's just going to be a contemporary group issue and we try to include ET data as much as possible in our recommendation. Uh, looking at some small changes in contemporary group formation, one of those being PIN. And uh, if PIN being a, is an important source of information, treating PIN as a random effect in here rather than as part of the contemporary group to a, keep that contemporary group from being subdivided too much in these on test types of systems. So um, with that, I'll move on to bovine respiratory disease. I don't really need to lay out, I don't think very much what the importance is. I think Allison did a pretty good job of that already. And talking about overall respiratory disease is definitely a heritable trait and, and something that, that we should be worried about as an industry overall. And given that, there's been a lot of efforts um, with this CAP grant, with efforts in several different uh, academic institutions uh, including here, trying to get an idea of what we can do about respiratory disease and how we can collect more data to be used in national cattle evaluation. As I said already, there's been good evidence from the genomic data on the CAP grant overall and other sources that, that there is a lot of heritability to be gained um, by uh, and, and opportunity to select for resistance to respiratory disease overall. Been several other papers that, that use quite a bit of data, uh, different methods and so forth, and different ways of measuring, but at least suggest that, that uh, respiratory disease is somewhat heritable even on a traditional pedigree scale. So um, I won't go very much into the CAP grant overall other than to say that, that uh, some of what Allison said already, that there's certainly places that look like they're, they're very important for respiratory disease overall. So. Um, so what do we do? How do we deliver tools for EPD for susceptibility overall and what needs to be done and what will go into this tool? What type of phenotypic data are we willing to accept into a system like that and what type should we collect? And what kind of genomic data can we use to correspond with that? If, uh, and how can we tie those two things together so that we have data that actually evaluates uh, or validates some of the results of these efforts, such as the old Zoetis project that was funded years ago, uh, back when it was Pfizer, up to uh, the current CAP grant right now. So, so this is a complex trait. It presents a number of challenges, just, just the fact that uh, of respiratory disease being, being actually a complex. It's, a, it's not a disease that's caused by just one pathogen. It's caused by several different pathogens, and all of them are being classified as the exact same thing. There's a good chance a lot of what we see in year-to-year -year variation in genomic studies or, or in, uh, in pens and feedlots is due to whatever happened to be the hot bug that year and, and that season and that time, and that's the one that, that we're actually seeing signal, signal for on our genomic studies and things like that. 
Doesn't mean that there's not complementary between, between different pathogens, but it, it means that there's probably things that are very specific to something like Mannheimia and Hemolytica that aren't necessarily specific to uh, BVDV or, or BRSV or something like that. And it's important to realize that as we go into this that that the chance is that we find something for respiratory disease on, on increasing our data and that might work really well in one set of, of pathogens and may not work as well with another set of pathogens, that, that particularly, uh, particularly when we look at things within a year. Um, that said, I made that sound kind of defeatist and I don't mean it to sound that way. It, it goes back to me saying that we need more data and we need a lot more data so that we get a good idea that, that when we start to average over effects or sire lines that start to have a real effect, we have it uh, based on something like 50,000 or 100,000 animals with evidence. And so that if this herd in Colorado right now was affected by Mannheimia, and so were seven other herds in, in, in feedlots in, in several other areas of the country, we start to get some sire breed averaging and connectedness between those sets through either genomics or through traditional pedigree methods that give us something to actually stand on and get an idea that we're actually doing something about the, the complex overall. So given that, um, what we have in general in the data is a treatment record. Um, it's binary, it's a yes or no, it's a cowboy poll. Um, we talked about scoring system, Allison's did, and, and again, it's a complex of several pathogens, so what is the real BRD even under that complex? You might have a viral, viral pathogen that causes very severe symptoms that doesn't cause the temperature of the animal to rise very much, whereas Mannheimia almost always going to cause the animal to spike over 104 degrees if it's, if it's actually producing leukotoxin. So, um, what level of detail is available from industry store sources? That's our limitation on that side. Um, primarily, we're looking at the feedlot segment of the industry. There is BRD pre-weaning uh, on, on pastures and so forth, but we don't know. Usually, it's not recorded very well. And um, are we worried about true resistance or just whether the animal is symptomatic? And that's something to think about with all these scales and everything else. We might have animals that are picking up the disease that definitely are fighting it with their own immune system, but these animals are, are evolved, so to speak, selected to not look sick because looking sick uh, makes you more of a target for a predator, right? And, uh, and the fact is these animals just don't look sick often when they have this disease. There's a lot of subclinical animals out there. And that fact uh, probably hides a lot of the animals that, that we would like as phenotypes that we just don't get. Whereas if we look at resilience, we're talking about animals that, um, that seem to maybe show that subclinical signs and maybe are able to fight it and move on past it without being treated. So. Uh, so anyway, we need some standardization of data and I'll go into what we have right now. Um, I wanna qualify this that we ex fully expect this guidelines to be revised at the next revision because this is just a preliminary attempt to take the data we think is out there and try to do something with it for cattle evaluation or for genomic testing, so, okay. So this was the committee that went into this. We had two uh, vets on this um, that, that both have a lot of experience in, in, uh, in BVDV. We had three folks that, well, four folks actually that were uh, representatives from the CAP grant right here, different aspects of the CAP grant. And then we also had, uh, had myself from here where, where I helped to lead the effort on respiratory disease genetics um, here at the Meat Animal Research Center for the host genetic side. So, um, so uh, our two DVMs that are working with feedlots, Dr. Lowe and Dr. Griffin, basically told us about two and, and researched for us two different widely used feedlot software programs that are used by several feedlots around the country. As many as 80% of the cattle going through feedlots are using systems, the, one of these two systems right now. Realize that doesn't cover 80% of the feedlots, that covers 80% of the cattle where most of those cattle are just in a few feedlots. If you think about sizes of feedlots in places like Cactus or Five Rivers or places like that. Um, two, so there's two different widely used databases and uh, basically we were able to get summaries of what kind of reporting rates we get on those database systems right now. And these are the types of things that are in that system. 
in those systems being recorded by feedlots on a regular basis. And if you see what the compliance rate is and how much the, the, the items in the fields are actually being used, you start to see some things that we could use that would go into models if we're talking about any trait, let alone just respiratory disease. They, they have when the cattle came in, when they left, usually why they left, how many animals started if on a pin basis summary. Notice this isn't an individual animal ID information, this is more for pins. Um, most of them have who the owner, the buyer, and the origin are, not quite the buyer, I guess a little less than half. So the, these are the types of things that give us an idea of, of where we could form contemporary groups if we just were able to get a dump of a database system coming out of some of these feedlots right now. And then if we're talking about treatment information and what's being recorded right now, these are the animals that are being pulled by cowboys. Um, we usually have the date, or always pretty much have the date and the weight of the animal. Most of them take a temp. Um, a lot of them don't have a severity score, but some of them do. That would help with some of this, this uh, scoring system we talked about earlier, what products have been applied. So the treatment type is, is almost always there. And then a few other things that, that often aren't there. And a diagnosis is almost always reported, but often it may not be pneumonia. It might be, I don't know what it is. It's sort of like uh, culling reasons we get for cows, uh, as most of our breed association folks know. So, um, so the data is being recorded in some form. This isn't obviously perfect. It doesn't get at things like what pathogens are there, what's going on right now, nothing of the sort. It, it's basically was the animal pulled and was it treated. But can we use this data to leverage for, for genetic improvement? And what, what we started to think about for the guidelines then is really what we can recommend from this and, and see see how this could be used in genetic evaluation studies. And we decided to suggest as a group a tiered approach to recording basically with different levels of how comfortable we are with the data that has been coming in for actually establishing a real diagnosis of BRD based on the data those feedlots are recorded. Um, it en enables some flexibility in the data where, uh, where there'll be a preponderance of data that has low accuracy that we can just call treated for BRD and, a lot, and then a, a smaller amount of data that's probably a little more accurate but a little less observed that would, uh, would say that this is more likely to be an actual BRDC case rather than something else. And we envision um, both uh, these phenotypes on these tiered levels being used for both genomic data and in genetic evaluations. So the first tier, the, the basically the lowest accuracy trait, is thinking about having animal IDs, something we need to have the feedlots don't always record right now, but if this is going to work for a genetic evaluation system or with a DNA system, we do have to have a way to tie the record to the animal. That's a stumbling block, but not part of the guidelines, something that has to be done on a breed, breed association or academic level in order to get the databases tied together. Um, we need the lot information, as I mentioned, most of that's fairly well recorded, and treatment information if available. And use that then to create a binary information uh, observation of whether the animal's treated or not. Mostly this is fairly standard stuff, guys. This is the type of thing everybody's been able to do, but I just want to point out it's important that most of this can be done if we can tie the animal ID together with, with the current databases that feedlots are generally using right now. And then more of the gold or standard, the tier two thing is basically trying to use a, the information where we have it to come up with a more specific measure of whether the animal has, has a more, more, uh, more sure level of whether they really have BRD or not. The first level, the presumed is what I mentioned right now, they were either treated or they weren't. We kind of guess that that's a BRD case, but we might have something then if the temperature data available is that's a little bit more of a sure category whether they have active BRD or not. So a yes, no on that level. And then we have another level. I don't want to talk much about the chronic right now um, because that's kind of a, a class by itself, but a confirmed BRD as well where actually the animal was somehow either later after they were, they were harvested or during their uh, treatment, they were actually uh, ultrasounded. You had a thoracic ultrasound or a whisper stethoscope that actually diagnosed uh, pneumonia problems in the animal's lungs at the time that they were treated. 
okay? So if you think about three of those levels, forget the chronic right now, presumed, active, and BRD, really these aren't a level of severity because the animals in all three levels could be severely sick. It's a level of specificity. We're more sure about whether the animals were sick as we go through each of those tiers. And the idea then basically is as, as we're able to use it, in a, in a traditional genetic evaluation approach and potentially in, in genomics, we could have those traits be used in a multi-trait context where, where animals are scored under each of the three scales, where the data is available, it'd be missing if you can't go to, to, from presumed to active. All the animals would have a presumed one zero, right? And then animals where you could start to diagnose better, you could put in the active class being one or zero, depending on whether they had a temp over 104 or not. And then animals, the few animals there are that were actually confirmed using, using some measure of, of actual lung function could be categorized into that last category, okay? Um, there's some other possibilities here that could be done down the road. This is the beginning of our guidelines right now. Um, that the, uh, things such as the temperature could be another trait by itself that's being measured at the same time too. That's probably not going to be written in the guidelines right now, but, but, uh, but it's something that we certainly should be looking at as a group and trying to determine whether it's important or not. Um, pen will likely be an important environmental component. Again, this is sort of like what I mentioned about intake, but even more important here, where, where a lot of the epidemiology is actually happening on the pen level. And fitting PIN separately from the contemporary group, again, in this case, could really help us in, in multiple ways. One, that we don't subdivide contemporary groups too much, as I mentioned before. And the other thing is that uh, from epidemiologically, we could fit correlation structures to PINs based on proximity to one another that may allow uh, uh, some increased accuracy from our evaluations as well. So if a PIN is actually adjacent to a PIN with a large outbreak, you'd expect it to be more likely to be transmitting disease and have cases than, than PIN that is across the yard, okay? So, uh, so that's another recommendation we're making and, and fitting it outside the st structure as a random rather than a fixed effect could help us do that. So I'm starting to run out of time for Matt. So just summarize that uh, there's a real opportunity, I think, to do something here. Our next step needs to be thinking as a group that, that we're, we're pretty much, I think this got approved by the board, Mark. Is that correct? This, at least this initial stage got approved for BRD. Does anybody else on the board know that? Yeah, okay, all right. So, so uh, I think that part, the, the feed efficiency is still coming. Um, there's considerable data being recorded in the feedlot. We just need to figure out how to screen it. I think what I've stayed here gives us one tool to maybe screen that data and an EPD uh, eventually using genomics and genetics may be possible as we move forward in trying to recover some of this feedlot data. So. With that, um, I know this was a little drier than some of the other things we're talking about because it's policy, but uh, if you uh, have any questions, go ahead. Any questions for Larry? Larry, maybe I'll ask a, a quick question. So having uh, BIF guidelines that help standardize recording of phenotypes is one thing. Uh, the other thing, though, is having breed associations that are geared up to accept the data and then do something with it. Um, I know you don't know maybe the answer for all, but, but do you have a feel for where people are positioned to, to do that? Yeah, I, I don't know that we're... Uh, I'm sorry if I, I'm wrong about this, and you guys can correct me quickly, all, all of you that are here in the room, but I don't have a feeling that there's a big database format that has empty tables right now just ready to fill up for BRD data. Um, I'm probably right about that. And uh, if, feel free to object, right? <laughs> so, so no breed associations are here in the room and, that are saying that. I, I don't think there's anything out there yet, Matt. Um, there's good and bad things about that. If, if we're willing to talk about it this way, I think we can talk about, we've got a database structure already that might be easily transferred into something to be received from that feedlot group to 
the breed associations. And I'd like to look at this as an opportunity for how these breed associations and, and BIF can communicate in, in developing a nice structure for receiving this data since there's not something already kind of uh, founded. Now that said, I realize all these have to adapt to systems that are in place already. It's not that easy. What I'm getting at is, is transferring the actual tables of data it might not be that bad if we can get a format for doing that quickly off of something like this. So.